still is Australia's most trusted brand of garden power tools, backed by 95 years of German engineering excellence. To get your hands on their range, visit your local still dealer today or visit still.com.au. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail ordering service, offering a wide range of quality gardening products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hi, I'm Joanne and uh, we're back with the Garden Gurus Live this morning. It's great that you could all join us on this lovely Friday morning. Uh, we've got a good, exciting show lined up for you today and uh, we're going to start with some Garvinia gerberas to show you from our good friends over at Garden Express. All around Australia, we've had some lovely rainy, some, some, some of us had too much rain and, and wet spring. So get cosy and comfy this morning and get those questions in ready and I'll try and get through as many as I can. Later, I'll share my special plant of the week and I've, um, as usual, form, I've brought two of them in two varieties. So that'll be exciting. As always, those garden questions give you a chance to win some prizes. So make sure you include the location to help me answer them um, more direct for yourself. I'll also be sharing another sneak preview, preview of um, episode four of the Garden Guru Spring Series uh, 2022. And please make sure you hit that like button. So today we're going to go straight over to the lovely people at Garden Express and we're going to be discussing the Garvinia gerberas, which are a delightful plant that will flower continuously over spring, summer and autumn. So is, have we got Rowan set up? Hi, Rowan. Hey, Joanne. How are you going? Very well. Have you got rain over there this morning? No, it's a beautiful, beautiful spring morning today. Sun's out. It's glorious. Fabulous. We are too. So let's hope the rest of Australia is feeling the same way. Indeed. You've got a fantastic um, uh, special here on some uh, on some Garvinias. Yes. The uh, Cheeky Collection. Yes. Yeah, so we've actually got a couple of collections. We've got the Cheeky Collection and also the Sweet Collection. Um, Garvinias, if uh, viewers aren't totally familiar with them, they're, they're a small gerbera. Um, a much smaller smaller variety than the traditional gerber, but um, they also flower prolifically, like you said before, um, you know, all the way through spring to autumn. Um, brilliant. They can they can have, you know, 70 to 100 blooms in that time. Yeah. Um, brilliant little plant for the, uh, for the garden or ideal for a pot on a balcony or something like that. Yeah, they're a fabulous producer, aren't they? And they're easy to grow as Maybe. long as you've got them in the right position. Um, yep. In a well-drained but moist soil, you'll find that they'll take off for you, um, yeah. even full love, sun love, in most areas. Sorry, they love a full a full sun to a part shade position, so they're very very versatile. Yeah, um, and they'll they'll handle um, the cold weather too, which is really good for um, obviously the southern states. Um, you know, up to about minus five, and they'll they'll still battle through winter and give you that that fabulous show um, come spring. Yeah, yeah, they're fantastic. I love the fact that you can grow them in pots too and they keep going. So as long as you tip prune them off, in fact, it will encourage more flowers to come up also. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got um, three different ones, like we've got cheeky red, cheeky orange and cheeky yellow. Yes. And, and then you've also got uh, in the sweet collection, sweet fiesta, sweet sunset and sweet frosting, and they're all different colours. So if somebody's buying a pack of them, or one of each, they're going to end up with um, a good amount of colours in that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, and they really are stunning colours, as you see there on the screen. Like, they're, they're beautiful, the yellows, the oranges, and obviously you can't go past the pinks. Yeah. The sweet ones are really pretty because, of course, they're dual coloured too. Yeah. Um, you know, the first one, the Fiesta, has got pink flowers with some really lovely little white highlights. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, they're really pretty. Um, look, tell us how long, if I order them here from WA, yep. um, what sort of time frame do you think it would be before I receive them? Um, the guys are well and truly up to date with orders, so you could have them within the week um, over to WA. Obviously, it's got to go through quarantine yeah. uh, into the into WA and Tasmania. But, um, yeah, you, 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 we're, we're totally up to date. Australia Post is doing everything they're supposed to be. Um, so, you know, up, you know, a week, a week is about the right time. So um, I've also, I, I just grabbed um, 
you know, what you're going to get. So if you if you get the collection of three, this is how it all arrives. So it's really well looked after. Um, and the plants, the plants are just looking uh, amazing at the moment. Really, really healthy and beautiful, ready to ready, ready to pop into bloom once you get them in the pot of the garden. They're a good size, Rowan, and I love the packaging because I know that they come really well um, preserved in that too. Yeah. And if it's only a week or, or even two into WA, it's not long to wait. No, that um, be, so we give them, obviously, give them a bit of water, keep them nice and moist, um, and yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll arrive to WA. Fantastic. In great condition. So they've been reduced from 3270 for the collection of three down to 2450 Yep. which is a pretty good price. Yeah, it's a 25% saving on those two collections, yeah. uh, which is really beautiful. Um, and, um, you know, if you if you can't decide or you want all of one colour, then they're $10.90 for the individual uh, individual okay. plants. But obviously, uh, if, you, if you like a bit of colour in your garden, the collections are the way to go. Absolutely. So that's the Garvinia Jobras. Everyone should get on top of that. Rowan, thanks for your time today. Yeah. I hope that warm weather in Melbourne continues on for you. Well, we, we've got a forecast of rain, so hopefully it sticks around for a little while. Um, but I think uh, over the next few days we, we're back to rain, but good, good to be coming out of that weather for sure. Oh, well, make the most of the next couple of days. Thanks okay. for your time today, Rowan. Thanks, Joanne. Always nice to have a chat. Yeah. See you soon. Bye. So, they're, look, they're well worth looking at. Um, Gerberas are always such a fun, bright essence into your garden so if you can get ones that are going to flower with you know 100 to 150 flowers over that long period um, and my understanding is that they're just a much easier gerber to look after also so perhaps look into that so um we're going to get up get going with the q a now because uh of course we we want to get through as many questions as we can and just before we start um i'm sorry everybody you've pulled up the photos just before we start um, I wanted to go over a question that was asked of me last week and I made a total mess of it because I didn't even think about what I was doing. I think it was near the end of the program and you can tell after I've been talking for an hour I start to burble a bit and lose words. Anyway, the question was that somebody had um, some stink bugs and they had a lot of them to the point where they were damaging your garden. So a stink bug is something that doesn't have a natural predator. So if they do get out of hand... Um, then you do need to treat them. If they're not out of hand, though, leave them because they are a predator insect and they'll go for all of the, um, the caterpillars, larva of other beetles, aphids, all of those sorts of things. So they can be a good bug in your garden. Um, don't go too close to them because as soon as you do, as soon as they sense that, they will let off that stink bug and it is a pretty horrible smell. So if you've got a lot of them, the then I would be looking at a natural way to get rid of them. And that would be with a bucket of soapy water. Some people say to put vinegar in that, but I'm always a little bit nervous using vinegar because uh, it can burn the leaves of certain plants. Uh, so I just stick, I would stick with the soapy water um, and you can either spray that over the tree or you can actually grab a branch, especially if it's something like citrus, which often uh, stink bugs are on, and just shake that branch and let the water drop into, uh, sorry, let the bugs drop into the water and that will kill them off. Um, so, yeah, I'm very sorry that I didn't get um, to them. Oh, one of the things I wanted to say too was that they're attracted, of course, by light, as most bugs are. So, and they overwinter in your house or in the crevices of your house. If you're in a brick house, they find a little crevice, etc. So, if you leave your lights off during those times um, coming through autumn, if you try and uh, leave them as low as possible or not on, then you'll get less bugs that overwinter in your area. They'll go elsewhere. Um, and then, of course, they come out in late July, August. So, that's when you want to preventatively look at, look at them. Um, it's, apparently clove oil is something that they hate the smell of. I'm not quite sure how you're going to disperse that. Perhaps uh, 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 incense thing in your tree, I don't know, but clove oil is something that they dislike. Um, and you can't exactly uh, paint clove oil onto your leaves either. I think it might be a bit thick for the, the cells of the leaves. So, But um, they're worth having in your garden if you haven't got too many, but as the person last week had too many, try the soapy bucket. 
Okay, let's get on with this week's and thanks very much. Okay, so our first um, question is from Libby and Libby's in Glen Iris in Melbourne and she's showing us a picture here of a rose that she's got a beautiful rose and it's got the most amazing flowers with an extraordinary scent. But since I've had it pruned, the new growth has not looked healthy at all. The leaves have a tinge of silver-like dust on them. Uh, help, what could be the problem? Okay, so what you've got is you have a, um, a powdery mildew. Now, there's a number of different ways that you can have this. It may have been one of the hints that you said to me whether it's happened since you've um, had it pruned. So perhaps the person that pruned it um, has pruned with their secateur something else that had some spores of powdery mildew on it. And as soon as you use that pair of secateurs on your rose again, you will transfer the issue from one plant to another. So it's always really important that when you're pruning, I'm constantly, I usually have a little uh, tin of um, either lemon juice or whatever sort of um, lemon juice. You can also use uh, bleach, things like that. And what you want to do is just dip your, your, um, your secateurs into it, wipe the blades clean and then start pruning. So if you have any thought that maybe you've got something like powdery mildew or any sort of disease in your plants, clean your tools as you go and you'll have far less of them. Keeping in mind, it may not have been that that's caused it. It may just be that they um, it's an airborne uh, fungus and it can travel hundreds of kilometres So and just distributing along the way to everybody's garden. So it may just be that the wind has brought that in and that's why it is. There's a couple of different ways that you can uh, deal with it. Uh, copper fungicides have been used in the past. I prefer not to use copper fungicides. They're a heavy metal they leave it in your in, in the soil, which is not great for the soil. Um, and if you're spraying something that's got fruit on it, well, you particularly don't want it to be absorbing the heavy metals either. Um, so neem oil works well. Um, and also the, the one that I guess I would uh, like the best for it is uh, potassium bicarbonate. And that's... Um, you can find that in the form of eco fungicide. And I think that's an Australian wide one. So um, have a look out for that um, eco fungicide. Um, it will give you the, uh, the instructions on what you need to do and it will be um, easy enough to get away. Just keep in mind also that when your rose is affected by something like this, then other insects and pests will come in too. A little bit like us, when we're low ebbed, we end up with everybody else's flu and coughs. Same things with plants. So try and keep an eye on your plant. And if you do get um, aphids and, and other black spot or anything like that coming in, know that your plant needs to be fed well. And this is the time of year you can. Give it a good um, uh, mineral fertilizer and that will really certainly build it up. So powdery mildew, you've got some work to do. Uh, but it's it's not going to be too harmful. You'll be able to get rid of that and you'll go back to those beautiful roses. Um, all right, so now we're looking at, we're in um, Rolly Stone. So we're back in Perth and Kerry has asked a question and she's wondering what's wrong with her mango leaves and how should she treat it? Um, my sense, Kerry, and Rolly Stone is up in the hills, the southern part of the hills in Perth. And um, it's, it's a cooler area there. It's a good area to grow a lot of things, so things that we can't grow here down on the flatlands. Um, however, the mango tree, I would say, um, although you can grow them easily in, in uh, Rolly Stone, you've probably got a little bit of an area that's perhaps too wet, uh, the soil hasn't dried out, or we have had an awful lot of rain. My feeling is that it's most likely something like anthracnose, or if not that, it's certainly a, um, uh, a fungal prop issue. So, and mostly it's, it's uh, fixable. If you haven't got too many of those leaves, uh, take them off. Um, and the control for this, so you need to preventatively look at it also. So don't just think about what you need to do now, but what you need to do in future too. And the way you control something like anthracnose, and it's a really common problem with mangoes, um, is to spray them um, when the first flower buds start coming out. 
So you, flower, you, you spray them when the flower buds come out and then monthly until the end of spring. All right, so it's not too long. You don't have to do it for the whole year, but certainly do that. Um, and do it early in the morning before the bees wake up so you're not doing any damage to the bees. Um, again, copper used to be used for this also. Um, I just have a bit of an obsession about not using copper because of the heavy metals, uh, but wettable sulfur works extremely well on them. So remove the leaves, clean your secateurs as you're pruning up your mango tree and um, get some wettable sulfur onto it. Make sure also that your soil is well drained. I know that in Rolly Stone it can be a little bit heavy in places. So make sure you've got good drainage. The soil will stay moist but not wet and that will certainly help with the uh, fungal issues. All right, so now we're off to Sydney and we have no pick on this but Suzanne has asked, do Dianella Streetscape have berries? Um, and she's unable to find the information online. All Dianellas will have berries that are the ones that I deal with anyway, the, the genuses I've got that we sell. Streetscape will have this very beautiful blue, almost purple flower, and then after that you'll get a purple berry from it. Now, if you're concerned about the berries, you might have children or you might have really inquisitive animals that tend to play with the berries or maybe will eat them um, and you're concerned that they may be poisonous, then cut the berries off. As soon as they've flowered, deadhead them. Take all the flowers out as they're dying and then you won't get the berries. So I hope that's helped. Okay, uh, we're off to Melbourne and Gray has asked, I tried the oh, I tried the boron on my lemon tree as suggested and all the leaves fell off within a week. Please help, what can I do? Um, Gray, I'm very sorry if it was me that told you to use Borin. You can use Borin, but I would be using it in the warmer months, not the wet months. So I'm very sorry about that. Um, perhaps I haven't given you the, the full extent. Or maybe we could blame this one on Trevor instead. Anyway, when I'm looking at your photo, I can see that the pot you have is relatively large, but I would suggest you need a larger pot and coming into spring, um, that's what you want to do. Quite often the leaves will also curl under the way they are from the tips, um, from the cold. And I know that um, being in Melbourne, I know you've had some really cold weather also. So I would consider putting it into a wider pot. Um, if the, the citrus has a much wider root system, it's got more root system to look after itself. So it will be a healthier plant. Um, I would probably put it into some good potting mix, some good premium potting mix. And after a couple of weeks of that, give it a, a, a half strength um, uh, fertilizer. And you watch as the sun comes out, as we get warmer weather, you should certainly get some more leaves coming on that and it should do well. If not, I think you need to get back to us and maybe we'll have a phone conversation. All right. So Sydney again, oh, we're having some trouble. And most of the trouble these days is with water. So Lauren in Sydney has said, um, I have a plant. She's had this plant for 11 months. It's an anthurium. And it's going, been going well and had six flowers on it. Now it looks like this. Can you please help me get back to looking fantastic? All right. So I'm wondering, Lauren, how much you fed the plant and whether it's outside in a cold position. So there's a couple of things that can happen. If you've not fed the plant, but it's been generous enough to give you how many flowers, six flowers, and there's still a little one on there at the moment, it may be that it's exhausted itself. So you need to consider fertilizer for it. And the other thing that they hate is cold. So if you've got that outside, um, you possibly would be best to put it into a very sheltered position away from the cold wind. Um, and somewhere where it gets some nice warmth uh, from the sun, and that should help it. I would use a liquid fertilizer, uh, one for fruit and flower, not just for growth. And I think you'll find that that'll come back nicely. They're really tough plants, and although it looks like it's had a little bit of battering, it'll come back for you, so I wouldn't be too concerned. All right, good luck with that, Lauren. All right, we're off to Melbourne again, and Joe has asked, I have two beautiful camellia bushes in full bloom, but the flowers dropping off are way long 
before they can be enjoyed on the plant? Is there anything to do to prolong their life? When flowers and fruit drop, it can often be an inconsistent watering. And I know we're having a lot of water. Okay, so we've got a lot of um, rain happening. Um, I, I think that if you have a more consistent watering, keep in mind that camellias are also very shallow rooted. So uh, put some good mulch on the soil, which will help keep them uh, comfortable and they're more likely to hold on. If you've overfed a plant, it will drop its flowers. And if you've underfed a plant, it can drop its flowers also. So have a look at your feeding regime. And um, camellias like to be fed every four to six weeks. So it would be a good idea maybe to give them a food. I would perhaps just let them flower for the moment and then after that, then start feeding them up again. And hopefully next year you won't have so many fall off. I think the beauty with a camellia, though, is when they fall and lie under the camellia bush, they're as beautiful as what they are when they're on the bush. Um, pick some of those up. Put them into a saucer of water. You don't need to even have a stalk on them, just a very smaller part of that. Sit them into the bowl and they look fabulous on a table or a windowsill too. So enjoy them either way. All right. So... Lauren, uh, no, we're down to, I beg your pardon, we're down, we're going off to Shepparton now, and Francis has set, said, why are my petunia seedlings dying? Well, there's all sorts of reasons why petunia seedlings could be dying, Francis, um, and I'm not sure what sort of uh, soil you have in Shepparton, but I do know that you've got, um, you, it's a cool climate. I actually don't sell petunia seedlings over the winter time. I sell far less of them unless the person that's buying them off me can um, assure me that they are in a really uh, full, full sun position. They, uh, they go kind of dormant over the, the winter time. So if they haven't moved, then that could be the problem. If they have started growing and then died back again, it can be a number of things. It can be a fungal thing where there's too much rain and the leaves will look brown, soggy, sometimes have a little bit of white fungal on them. And then, you know, perhaps they've, they've had too much water and either your soil is, is too heavy and needs to be, um, it needs to then have some gypsum in it to open it up, to let the, the water drain or it's just a fact that it's going to be really wet and cold in Shepparton at this time of the year. Um, yeah, I hope that helps you. Um, okay, so now we're in Claremont. Lynn from Claremont. Um, would now be a good time to prune my viburnum hedge? Uh, and can I cut it back quite a bit? Also, when is a good time to plant? Well, let's go back to that one. Lynn from Claremont. Yes, this is a perfect time to um, hedge your viburnum plant. Um, if it's finished flowering, I know that there are still some in the garden centre that are still flowering, um, but it is they're, they're sparse. So, uh, yes, you can hedge it. Um, I once had a, um, a viburnum hedge and somebody came in for me and did some, some pruning and they pruned it back to about two foot off the ground, so about 80 centimetres or something, and it just took off again and took off really nicely. So you can, if your viburnum hedge is very sparse at the base, then I would take it back a third. And then in a couple of months time when it's growing, I would take it back a third again. You're effectively taking it back half, but you're allowing it to have as many leaves on it still to be able to grow and thrive. If you cut it back too low and it's too woody, then you'll find it won't come back or it'll take an awful long time and it'll look a bit ugly for quite a while. So take it back in stages or if it's a good healthy one and you're just wanting to wallop it off, then do so because they're really hardy and they can do it. Okay, then the other question of that was also when is a good time to plant my frangipani from a large pot into the ground? It's about two metres high. That'll be a nice plant to put straight into the ground. I'd actually wait till it's a little bit warmer and when the, re the rain goes. They don't like to be too wet. They can rot off, especially if you're planting it from a pot into a different situation. So wait until it's a little bit warmer. When you see our mornings are consistently warm and a lot of the rain is gone, 
that's when I'd be doing it. In the meantime, maybe give it some um, EcoVital or some sea soil and get the soil that it's in prepped really well um, so that it has an easier life trans um, going from transplanting from the pot into the ground. All right, so West Melbourne, and Matthew has asked, when shall we cut off a waratah flower? It's only started to open now and would love to make the plants more bushy rather than just one main stem. Well, it depends on whether you want to look at the waratah flower on the plant or whether you want to have it in a vase. Personally, I'd probably, if it's a very young plant, I'd let it go for a bit longer until it looks like it's starting to droop and then I would cut it back. And you're quite right, the more you cut a plant, excuse me, dead head, or take the flower off to use that inside or on your patio, the more branches are going to grow and the more flowers you'll get. Don't be in too much of a hurry, Matthew, to make it flower too quickly. So treat it gently because then as it gets older, you'll find it'll be a much stronger plant and you'll get so many more flowers. And I wish we could grow waratahs over here, gosh. Okay, Mount Gambia, which is in South Australia, and Samantha has asked, my daffodils haven't flowered. Do you have any suggestions, please? Okay, so if you planted that daffodil this year, they should definitely plant, um, flower. And I would, be I would be going back to see your garden centre um, or wherever you bought them to say that they haven't flowered uh, because most bulbs will flower, all bulbs should flower um, the first year especially. Now, if you didn't put them in recently and you've had them in your garden, you may or may not know that uh, with your bulbs, what you do is as they are dying is when you feed them. So last year, you needed to liquid feed those once a week when they're dying and leave the leaves on as they die down. They can look a bit unsightly, but it's better for the bulb. The bulb makes the decision of how many flowers and the flower it's going to grow out of what bulb as it's dying. So it may be that you didn't feed them well enough when they were dying. And then also that your soil might be depleted, so you're not getting um, many um, flowers. You might get one flower where the past time you got three. So make sure you've got good, healthy soil and that you feed your bulb as it's dying down. Um, and that should help. All right. So thanks for all your questions and we'll get some more done soon. Um, now to see something that uh, really helps those tough gardens. We're going to head over to the still shop where Neville Passmore went out to the Canning Vale shop recently and found out what they have on hand to make everyday activities a lot less, a lot easier. Let's take a look. So Paul, middle of winter, uh, pruning time, particularly for fruit trees. I've got a couple of real big fellas at home that need the big job. Big so job, all right. So still does have an extensive range of battery power chainsaws, starting at the MSA120C, which is a little baby of the range with a 12 inch chain up to the MSA220, which you can put a 16 inch chain on. Right. So great products, exceptionally well priced, and again, works extremely well. Okay, so that's the brake taken off, so now the machine will work, and that's with the brake engaged, so nothing's gonna turn. That's right. And what's the story so with So this, this is a quick chain adjuster. So obviously, quite common to lose your spanner to adjust the chain, or you simply over adjust, over adjust, over tighten the chain. Yep. So this here will allow you to adjust the chain without the spanner, and more importantly, it's very hard to over tension the chain. So again, it's just a, quite a simple, effective measure to adjust the chain and also to take the side cover off. Again, it's quick and easy and yep. you won't have any uh, hassles doing that, mate. Beautiful. Now this one looks like a more powerful machine. Yep, so that one's the MSA220. So that one currently is the most powerful battery chainsaw on the market. There is a bigger one coming, but for the meantime, the MSA220 is that saw. 16 inch bar and it does also take the APS 300 battery does work extremely well. And again, right. quick chain adjuster. Now I'm intrigued by this little fella here. That's an arborist's uh, chainsaw. Yep, hit nail on the head there. The MSA161 is an arborist saw. Very lightweight, uh, again, designed for that Pacific arborist market. Two hands on the chainsaw always. Chain brake, still standard practice. And it takes the APS battery, same as what's in the MSA220. Well, I think I've made my decision. 
I'm going back to number one. Number one? Easy done. <laughs> That's for me. <laughs> Let's go. That was interesting. I use steel equipment. I really like it. It's long lasting. It's good quality. Um, and the guys at this, all the steel shops that I've used are always really helpful if you've got a problem with it. So you might want to have a look at that. And we are now on to plant of the week. And I have chosen this week a plant that is in flower at this time of the year. I've just made the camera move. I'm sorry. You probably can see this is a baronia. Um, this is one of the new ones. It looks a little bit like Megastema, which is your the baronia that most people know of and which is one of the, the most highly scented. This one's called uh, Jack Maguire's Red. And Jack Maguire's Red is, like I said, very much like Megastema. It's got that lovely yellow um, inside. It almost looks like it's been hand-painted or airbrushed inside. And it's highly scented. Um, somebody once said to me, could I describe the Baronia scent? And I actually can't. It's a, a unique scent of its own. Um, it's, but one thing that I find, it's not that sickly scent that often people find with gardenias uh, that gives them a headache. This one I've not known to give headaches to many people at all. However, there is um, between 12 and 15% of the world that cannot smell baronias. And I feel really sorry for them because it's such a fantastic um, smell. Anyway, if you're one of those people, I'm sorry. But if you're not, this is the time of the year to look at getting a baronia. They can be difficult to grow in the ground. Um, they originate from the southwest of Western Australia. And um, they grow very well down there, even in the full sun, in the ground. A lot of people over the years that I've been in the garden centre have come to me and said, my baroni is dead, I can't grow it. it. I've tried one every year and I can't grow it. My comment to them is buy it as a bunch of flowers. Use it for what you want to, which is the scent more often than not. Put it on your patio table or just inside your door where it gives the whole house that beautiful scent of baronia. Um, and when it dies down, cut it back, tip prune it after it's flowered at least, and then plant it out. See how you go. If it doesn't work, you've spent between $15 and, say, $30, depending on the, the size of the plant that you're buying. Um, and if you consider what a, a bunch of flowers will cost, and they're going to die after a couple of weeks also, Treat it in that way and you won't feel so bad about it then. So that's the Maguire. There's so many different varieties. So I brought another one along to show you as well. And we'll see if I can get this right up close for you so you can actually see the flowers. They're just stunning, aren't they? So these are pink, pink both ways. And this one is was developed um, here in Perth by the Kings Park and, um, and Botanic Gardens. Um, and it's called Baronia Magenta Stars. Not as, um, not as scented as the brown ones, but a particularly pretty one. Um, now, they like um, an, a neutral to slightly acid soil, right? They like to be have a moist root system, but not overly wet. So they don't want their root system sitting in water, but they like to be moist. So they need a well-drained pot if they're in a pot or well-drained soil. You would think us mostly here in sandy soil in Perth would be able to grow them well. But as I say, they're not always the easiest plant to grow, but they're certainly a really pretty plant to have. This particular one, um, the, the, what did I say? Baronia magenta um, is a magenta star, is also um, a good for slight frost, not a heavy frost. So if you're living down in Tasmania or something, I would probably suggest that you grow this either in an extremely sheltered position away from the frost or even use it, like I said, in a small pot on your patio where you can um, bring your girl, girlfriends over, have a cup of tea and really enjoy the baronia smell. Anyway, that's the plant of the week today, baronia. Get out to the garden centre and see if you can't find a few different varieties and enjoy those. Okay, so I think we're getting back to some questions now, aren't we? Yes, let's answer as many as we can today. Okay, so L is in Turak, and L, I love your um, your little area. It's just beautiful. Um, you're asking. You wanted to plant a Portuguese laurel to create a dense, non-deciduous hedge. 
but I don't want the berries as I don't want the birds pecking at it. Please advise me if I've done he as I've done heaps of research, research and I'm stuck. It will be placed behind the box hedge, so I'm looking for a different type of foliage. The picture I've sent is the, court, is the courtyard, and then the result I'm looking for is in the second photo. That looks really lovely, doesn't it? I love your courtyard, though. I think I love the brickwork in it, too, and it'll look so nice. You can use the Portuguese laurel, and I think that would be a great choice. Um, the, the problem that you've got there is you don't want the berries. That's quite easy. Once it's flowered and you've enjoyed the flowers, prune it. That's when you must get out and prune it before the berries arrive and you won't have that issue. Now, if that's still, if that's something that you can't achieve, then maybe think about something like um, Marea hippi. So Marea paniculata would grow to three metres, which would be way too big. But you could also um, use the hippi, which only grows to about 1.2, say 1.5. So you'd have that double layer that you're looking for, but it wouldn't be so big that it would cover the beautiful brickwork that you've got. Um, and it, although it flowers and it's a summer flower, so you'd, I guess in a courtyard you might want to be concerned about having too many bees in a courtyard and it might be difficult. Um, so therefore, if that was the case, maybe look at something like Viburnum anvi, which again only grows to about 1.5, 1.6. And um, it flowers in the wintertime when possibly you're out there less or not sitting out there having, you know, cups of tea or glasses of wine with lots of bees around. Um, but, you know, consider the Portuguese laurel because it's a beautiful plant and I think it's a very classy plant and that's a very classy little courtyard. So good luck with it. Thanks, Al. Um, Northcliffe. So Northcliffe and Scott... Um, and Scott has asked, could you tell me what this might be? Absolutely. This is a poppy. It's in the Papervaceae family, um, and it is known as an opium poppy or a bread seed poppy. So um, they're, they're beautiful. I love them. I've got the, the single pink ones growing in my garden. You're very lucky to have the double ones. They're hard to come by. Um, Northcliffe, I'm not in WA. Yeah, I thought it was Northcliffe WA. Um, I'll swap you for some pink and you can bring me in some red. How does that sound? Um, easy, easy to grow. They're annuals. They self-sow everywhere and then come, oh, excuse me, then come up the next year um, and they just go all over the place. So if you've got too many of them, pull them out because you know the next generation will come through nicely anyway. So, yeah, opium poppy or bread seed poppy. Now, off to Canberra and David. Hi, what can I add to my veggie patch to improve the soil um, and the crop, for the crop? In the last few year that, years, they've been ordinary. I was going to dig patches out and put new soil in, but it's a very big job for me. That would be an awful job to do. Um, if you're going to put more soil in and look at a really good compost or a concentrate, um, you're in Canberra, so I'm sorry you I'm not sure who you would go to for, for good soil there. But make sure you go for a really good concentrate. Look, ask your garden centre who they go to, who they would go to, or even get some good, just a few bags off them and just lay a layer of that on top of your soil, all right, rather than digging out and putting in. That soil will then work through into your other soil and help replenish it. I would also suggest that you use... Again, something like EcoVital or with uh, lots of microbes and minerals in it or um, sea salt. Sea salt is always a good one. It's uh, good for the, the soil um, and it's a tonic for the soil, uh, which will help then the plants. Personally, I'd also be putting in some spreadable microbes and some uh, good mineral fertiliser, all right, because that will then sustain the work that you've done with the concentrate. And, of course, put a good mulch on top of that. Right? Make sure that you're feeding the soil. And feeding the soil means minerals and microbes. The plant will feed off the microbes. The microbes take the fertiliser to the plant. And so you get a much healthier plant from that if you build up the soil. Um, so your instinct was really right, David. Um, it is the soil you need to deal with. It's like anything. If you've got a good foundation, you know, whether you're raising children or building a house or building a garden, you need a good foundation, 
to get good product from it. So, hey, Tyson, back again. <laughs> so Tyson, for those of you who don't know, is from Baronia, Victoria, and Tyson is one of our wonderful every week uh, listeners. So hope you're having a nice day, Tyson. You're asking me, can I plant Alison snowdrift flower seeds and acorn baxia wildflower seeds? And can I please plant them in the ground or somewhere else? Okay, so with your alisum, your snowdrift, um, Tyson, you can plant those almost any time of the year if you're in Perth. Don't plant them in the very cold time in Melbourne um, or Baronia because they're not going to, um, they're just not going to come away nicely. So I would leave out winter and do them any other time of the year. Acorn banksia wildflower seeds, I have to be honest, I have no idea when when you would plant those, but I will write that down, Tyson, and next week I will answer that question for you. Okay, so have a great day, Tyson, and thanks again for joining us so regularly. Um, all right, so now we go over to the ATC, and Shirley says she's bought and planted a white mulberry weeping standard in the fall and found out too late that their roots are invasive. Is there any way to control this? Their roots can be invasive, First of all, I wanted to say I had someone asking for a white weeping mulberry a few weeks ago and I said, no, I'm sorry. And I've never seen one in WA. And as yet, the um, those suppliers that I get from over east haven't shown me any either. So that's amazing. I think a white mulberry, um, as most of you will, will know or may know, um, red mulberries, of course, are going to, or black mulberries, are going to make a, a real stain. So if you've got children running under them or animals running under them, they will take the the um, staining all over your patio, inside, etc. The white mulberry is way less likely to stain. Um, they do, they start white, but they can turn a pinky colour and some of them will turn quite dark. So don't be afraid if you do have a white mulberry and it comes out with the odd dark coloured um, fruit, that's normal with it. And the white mulberries are so much sweeter. They're really beautiful. Now, as far as your roots go, I would be inclined to um, make sure that you're deep watering. So whenever you have um, a tree that's got a tap root and it's also got some very strong laterals, I've got a weeping mulberry also, but it hasn't lifted any of my paving yet, yet I say. If I, if I ignored it, it may well do that. But what I make sure that it gets is that it gets a deep watering around the drip line, but driving the roots down. So when you've got um, a, a micro sprays or just a, a spray along the top, and you might do it every second day uh, to keep it moist over summer, try deep uh, watering it, and that should drive the roots down further. Um, you can get some root barrier. Um, contact one of the advanced tree farms or tree nurseries and they probably sell or have some root barrier and that can help also that would be that you just place that then around the tree and it hopefully won't go too far out from there so deep watering and maybe some root barrier okay maz maz is in ipswich queensland and she's just wondering how to take cuttings of sugar apple trees well I'm not sure. I've never done grafting. Well, I have. I've played around with it, but I'm not too sure, Maz. And um, I don't really want to answer a question that I don't know the answer to properly because then I'm going to give you some general answers that may or may not work. Um, Maz, I'm hoping you're not wanting to do it tomorrow um, because next week we can come back with that. Um, if I'm not on uh, next week, I'll ask Trevor to do some something about it. Thanks, Maz. All right, Jim from Sydney, and my question is, I purchased a Mandarin Imperial in winter 2019. It's about 80 centimetres high, and I've fertilised every quarter, and it has grown about 1.8 metres but never flowered. It, it is grafted on a rootstock of C35. What am I doing wrong, please? Probably a knot. 2019, what's that, three years ago, you know, I have an imperial mandarin and also a Hickson mandarin in my garden, and both of them took at least four to five years before they flowered well. I would get the odd flower, but they, they can, mandarins can take 
between three and five years before they start producing for you. The benefit of that is that they will establish a very good root system before they start producing. If they don't have a good root system when they're producing, you'll find that they can't, uh, they won't produce as many flowers or fruit for you, that they can't sustain things, that they'll be more susceptible to pests and diseases. So don't be too much in a hurry to do that um, to a mandarin tree. Also, imperial mandarins don't grow huge. So grow it slower, tip prune it down, let it come back up again, tip prune it down, let it come back up. The, the stages that you do it at, you'll find that you'll get a much better structure on the tree and it will withstand wind and also pest and diseases better. Okay, so I hope that's, don't think you're really doing anything wrong, maybe just a bit of uh, patience. And also though, you did say that you're um, fertilising it every quarter. You can fertilise um, through the um, spring, summer and autumn. You can fertilise your tree almost monthly. I do it six weekly. Um, and it certainly helps it. Again, make sure you get a good mineral fertilizer into it also, which helps the macro, so that it has lots of micro minerals in it. That helps the macro minerals uh, uptake by the tree, the tree able to uptake the, the minerals. And you'll find that you'll get a better flowering tree from that too. Okay, so Dutton, I've never heard of Dutton. Dutton in South Australia. Lorraine, I have no idea where you are except that you're in South Australia. So my cottonwoods are losing their leaves and young stems and new leaves are turning black. Sounds like you might have a fungal disease there, if that's the case. Um, again, I've given some good advice on fungal diseases earlier in the program that you must clean your secateurs as you go with each cut. So you could try cutting them back um, and you can cut cottonwoods back quite heavily. Um, if you've And a lot of South Australia does have heavy soil. So you might want to look at um, putting some gypsum into the soil to open that out so that the roots can really get down deep, right? Um, and also establish their root system better. The bigger the root system the plant has, the less likelihood it's going to get a fungal disease. That's not rule of thumb, but that, that does help because then the plant can process. It's kind of like putting a radio, a mini minor radiator into a Mack truck. It's not going to work. Same thing, you want a good heavy root system and that should help it. So try pruning them back, clean the secateurs after each cut, burn them, don't put them into your compost by any means um, and let's see what happens from there. After when it starts showing signs of coming back, that's when you feed it, not now. Wait till it's got over this, this and, and uh, had a bit of a prune. Okay. So we're in Mahogany Creek in WA, up in the hills. I love that area. What is a good ground cover that will suppress weeds? I've tried Grevillea ground covers, but find the weeds grow through it and it's almost impossible to remove them. Yes, it can be, can't it? Um, let me see. Hemiandra is a good one. My Porum is a good one. Um, probably those two would be the best for you. Um, they're quite thick. Um, but you'll find if you're in really fertile area, you may get still get some weeds coming through. But at least the weed will come through a very low ground cover because both of those um, are right up against the, the soil. They lay very flat. And that way you can at least grab at the weed rather than having to put your hand through a prickly grevillea. Um, you can use those grevilleas on the next level and then have them behind those ground covers. So I hope that helps for you. So then we're off to West Melbourne. Our frangipa frangipanis have never flowered and they're quite a few years old and only since last year have they been growing strong. Um, how do I encourage flowering? And this is Matthew and he's in West Melbourne. Um, Matthew, frangipanis will flower okay in Melbourne. Um, I would want to question what you've been feeding them. What sort of soil they're in? Um, is the soil overly damp? Um, otherwise, again, um, I'm repeating myself a lot, but I believe in this strongly, that if you get some good spreadable microbes into your soil and some good um, mineral fertiliser, you're treating the soil and that's what helps the flowering. Also, have a look at what your um, flowering, what your fertiliser is that you're using. If you're using one with high nitrogen for growth, 
then you that's at the you get good growth at the expense of flowers. So look at the the makeup of what your fertilizer is, and maybe get some good advice from a local garden centre, um, and and they'll have a, a they'll have a good mineral fertilizer, something like Troforte or Grow Grow Safe. I'm not sure that you get Grow Safe in Melbourne, but you'll certainly get Troforte. All right, been quite a morning. That's been fabulous. Thanks for all your questions. Um, and we'll be sure to get back to a couple of those that I was unable to answer today. Um, okay, so now for a sneak peek at tomorrow's episode of The Garden Gurus, episode four. We're going to see it again because, of course, last week with the sad passing of the Queen, we didn't get to show the episode. So here it is again for your enjoyment. <laughs> We've had a few food security scares in recent times and it says to me that it's always a good idea to have some herbs and veggies on the go at home. Now this tree is fantastic, it produces north of 250 fruit each season. They are absolutely fantastic. And now spring is here, it's time to give your lawn a makeover. Just have a look at these bananas. They are literally going bananas and in about a month's time, when they're ripe, they'll be the best bananas in the whole of Western Australia. So I've got some blood oranges from Trev's garden and make a kingfish and blood orange ceviche. <laughs> So you have to catch up with that this week. Um, all right. So make sure you hit that like button, share us around, and um, hopefully more and more people will come in, ask all those interesting questions, and that'll share the knowledge with everybody. Um, apologies if we didn't get to your question today. It's been pretty full on. They've been coming at us hard and fast. But it's been lovely answering those that we could get back to. And uh, being back again with you all is just great anyway. Jess, our producer, will send a message to all our seed winners after today's show. And I'll be in the chair next week, so able to answer those questions I didn't. And that'll be next week at Friday, 9 a.m. Western Standard Time. Remember, you can always jump onto our website and catch up with the previous stories from The Garden Gurus at thegardengurus.tv or your YouTube channel, again, thegardengurus.tv. Um, also, please make sure you tune in for the fourth episode of The Garden Gurus tomorrow, airing on Channel 9 on Saturday, and be sure to check your local guides for times. Happy gardening, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you next Friday. Thank you. And see.